Oh, hey, check it out. I found my old rubber band gun. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you what. If Usopp had this bad boy right here during Skypea, old Eneru would have been six feet under before the Maxim even took off. Hold on, let me see if I can hit the camera with it. Oh, no, okay, that was, well, that, that skews a little bit, like, two feet over, okay. Anyway, uh, kind of a surprise chapter today, because Golden Week is happening in Japan, so I believe there's gonna be a little bit of a break next week, and maybe even the week after, whatever, I don't know science. Point is, One Piece Chapter 1082 Review, titled, Let's Go and Claim It! Yeah, we're finally going to claim something. We're gonna go claim our, our, our tenth free sub at the sub place that's down the road. You know, that place, the sandwich shop, you get a little punch card, you know, you know, you fill out, you get nine sandwiches, you get your tenth one free. Let's go claim it! I think you get a free cookie too. Let's go! All right. So, um, cover page, we're back to the, uh, the fan requests. Uh, we just have Chopper eating Zeus because he thinks he's cotton candy, which is probably something that has has actually happened on board the Sunny, I would imagine. Like, Chopper wakes up in the middle of the night, and he's sleepy, and he's like, oh, no, oh, man, and then Zeus is there, and he's just kind of snoozing on the deck of the Sunny, and then Chopper bumps into him, and he's like, mmm, cotton candy. And it's kind of like a dreamscape, like, or like a sky island or something. Chopper's, like, on a cloud, and there's a rainbow. Prometheus is in the background, right? And this continues the, uh, the trend as of late. Now, these, these fans requests that Oda does, they're not really all that unusual compared to all the other ones he does, like the Straw Hats hanging out with random animals or something, but in these recent chapters, we've had Shanks and Garp and Aokiji, like a lot of brutal scenes going on. So you'll have like a, a, a cover page with Luffy watering some sunflowers and a lion there, and it's like, oh, the lion's getting watered, that's funny. And then that's the same chapter where Shanks just, oh, just slices Kid apart, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, look at this adorable scene with Chopper eating Zeus. That's so great. And we literally start the chapter off, first page, first panel, with a marine casualty. A confirmed marine casualty. Nothing like, oh, we don't know what happened to this person or what's up with this guy. No. Chapter starts off with a newspaper article um, that uh, Sengoku and Osuru are reading about, and the article is Vice Admiral T-Bone killed. T-Bone! We, we all know T-Bone, right? Come on, guys, please tell me you know about T-Bone. I can't be the only one. He was named after a steak. Come on, everybody! <laughs> Alright, so T-Bone, for those of you that don't remember, was the Marine. He was a captain uh, back during Water 7. Uh, remember that little mini arc that took place between Water 7 and Enny's Lobby, where uh, they were on board the sea train heading to Enny's Lobby? You know, Sanji, Frankie, and Soge King were there. That's where Frankie fought against Nero. That's where uh, Sanji fought against Wanze of, of CP7. Uh, T-Bone was also on that, uh, that, that, that train. You know, he was in one of the cars with a bunch of Marines. He was a captain at the time, and uh, he actually managed to uh, slice a sea king in half, which was really impressive, and then Zoro and the, uh, and the other Straw Hats were coming up on the Rocket Man, and then Zoro's like, hmm, there's somebody waiting on this railway. Somebody that can slice sea kings clean in half. And Zoro gets really, like, he's ready to go. Like, he takes out his uh, bandana, and he ties it up, and he has his swords, and he's, he's ready to fight. And then they see T-Bone on the tracks, and T-Bone is like, I am a captain of the Navy! In the name of everything good and right and kind! Kindness in the world, I will stop you here and now, Pirate Hunter Zoro. And so Zoro is just like, get off the tracks, you idiot. And then he's like, I shall not, for I am a knight and I fight for chivalry and justice. And then he uses a sword, which was uh, named Bamboo. And uh, his little shtick was, um, he despises crooked men and crooked sword play. So he doesn't like any curved swords. So anybody that uses a katana, oh, you're on you're you're on T-Bone's list right away. He's like, okay. So he uses this long, like great sword, and he doesn't make any curved slashes. He only makes right angle slashes. It's like he has one attack that was called Bone Swa, and so he just takes out his sword and just eh, uh. And it's just like like a square or like a rectangle. And um, Zoro was actually impressed. Go back and read those chapters or go back and see the episodes. And when 
you got to imagine, T-Bone is standing on the train tracks as a giant rocket train is heading straight for him. And that rocket man was booking, man. That thing was moving fast. And Zora was like, get out of the way or we're going to run you over. And T-Bone is like, I shall not, sir. And Zora was like, huh, man, this guy is pretty fierce. This guy is, if nothing, dedicated to the cause, okay? And so Zoro takes out his swords and he cuts down T-Bone. Doesn't kill him, but knocks him off the side of the track. He lands in the water and his men come to go save him. But from the little little moments we got with T-Bone, he was somebody that was really all about the humanitarian angle of this. If you want to talk about alignments in One Piece, T-Bone was probably the closest to like a lawful good Marine. Like, like genuinely lawful good. Like he was literally all about it. He was to the point of like tears streaming down his face. The idea that pirates had killed his men was enough to bring tears down his face. He literally faced off against the rocket man charging for him and he's like, I am a Marine, sir. I fight for justice and kindness in the world. And he's dead. He just died because of the Cross Guild's um, implementation of Marine bounties, putting bounties on Marine heads. He was killed. And we also see here, he was a Vice Admiral when it happened. So he was promoted to Rear Admiral since the time skip. And then now I guess Guess he was promoted again. Maybe he was posthumously promoted. Maybe they're like, all right, Rear Admiral T-Bone, he was a good man. We're going to promote him to Vice Admiral, you know, posthumously or whatever. Um, we saw him one point earlier. It was he was the dude that delivered um, when Fujitora, remember when Fujitora, you know, like bowed at everybody at Dressrosa and Akainu was like, you're not allowed to come back to Marine HQ until, you know, you've captured Straw Hat or whatever, you know, something like that, or until you've made this up for your actions. And um, Fujitora went to Reverie anyway. So T-Bone was the one that uh, delivered that report to Akainu, that Fujitora was at Reverie, he was going against his orders, and uh, Akainu kind of yelled at T-Bone for that, and T-Bone's like, oh, I'm sorry, sir, I'm, I'm just the messenger. I don't know what you want me to do, right? So here we see him in the paper. Uh, we see him with a uh, mustache and a beard combo, which is very appropriate for him. His mustache is a straight line. It's literally just a straight line on his face, and his uh, beard is just like two streaks right here going down, all right? He doesn't have a handlebar. He doesn't have the white beard stash. No, it's just a straight line. Very befitting for T-Bone. Man, I, I genuinely feel bad that T-Bone is right here just dead at the beginning of the chapter, right? I know a lot of people didn't give a crap about him, but hey, you know what? This is what Oda does. He could have killed just some random Marine, but he looked through the list of all the Marines that he introduced in this story, and he's like, no, I'm gonna kill someone that was actually named and we saw before in the story. He wasn't super important to the story, but... You know, you know, here he is, T-Bone, he's dead, all right? Uh, now, many people might wonder, how did a vice admiral get taken down by civilians? Because that's what it says in the paper. You know, the civilians ganged up on, um, on T-Bone, killed him, turned him into the Cross Guild, and now they're going to be getting paid money for turning in a Marine, okay? T-Bone, as I said, is very lawful good. He would never ever, under any circumstances, even if it costed him his life, raise a sword to a civilian. He would have never have done that, okay? So he is actually the perfect person out of all the vice admirals, out of all the high-ranking marines to have a bounty on their head. He is the one dude that I could genuinely believe, yeah, civilians could take him in. In fact, I could see T-Bone walking through a town that he was, like, in charge of or whatever, and then a bunch of the civilians came out and they were, like, shaking and, like, holding rifles and, like, you know, knives and swords. I'm like, I'm so, I'm so sorry, Captain, I mean, I'm Vice Admiral T-Bone, I'm so sorry, but my family needs food, we, we can turn you into the Cross Guild, I need money. I could honestly see T-Bone, like, trying to reason with him at first, but then eventually being like, ah, oh, your plight brings a tear to my eye, if my life is enough to feed your family, then please, I am yours, you know? I could see him pulling that, and you could say that that's stupidity, or you could say that that is, that's kindness, that's T-bone, man, that's chivalry. And I feel like a lot of people are just going to overlook this. I really do. I feel like a lot of people are going to read this chapter and just be like, oh yeah, T-Bone's dead. Who is that again? Oh yeah, the guy that Zoro one-shot at Water 7. Who cares? All right, moving on with the rest of the chapter. No, no, T-bone does not deserve to go out like that. T-bone deserved better. You know what? You know what? I'm giving him a funeral. We're doing a eulogy for T-Bone. Come on, we're going outside. We're doing this. Come on!
on, we're doing it, come on! <clears throat> Thank you all for coming today to lay to rest one of the greatest Marine soldiers that has ever graced the Grand Line. <clears throat> Generosity, benevolence, altruism. Travis D. Boner embodied these and all the other best parts of humanity. He was known as the great ship cutter T-Bone to his friends and comrades. Travis was something rarer in this world than even the One Piece. Travis was a good person. He was a good man. In his youth, he was a noble knight of the Terraco Kingdom, taking up the sword for honor and chivalry, defending the innocent and the downtrodden. After he joined the Marines, Travis continued to embody these virtues. Some would even say to a fault. His ultimate dream was to see this world filled with hope, kindness, and empathy. Just looking at each other and realizing that we are all human. We are all the same. Many would call this dream impossible or even childish. But in this big wide world we live in, can anyone honestly say that it couldn't be realized someday? <sighs> Rest in peace, T-Bone. The world is just a little bit more dim without you in it. Thank you all. All right. Uh, well, rest in peace, man. Rest in peace. I will be making a full-length 45-minute video about Captain T-Bone. I keep saying Captain, Vice Admiral. He was a Vice Admiral, damn it! I'll be making a full 45-minute video about Vice Admiral T-Bone in the future, so look forward to that. Oh, man. And with him, with his death, brings about the end of possible kindness in the world. Honestly, that's another thing that's symbolic about this, okay? Is And, and then one more thing, and then I will move on. But, like, the idea that the Marine that embodied kindness and altruism and humanitarianism the most died. I'll go in more into it with the video that I'm going to make about him, but um, the weight of that should not be overlooked. All right. So we're at Marine HQ right now. We're at Navy HQ, uh, where we are in the cafeteria kind of area. We have Osuru, Vice Admiral, the great staff officer, having a meal with Sengoku, who is currently the General Inspector, former Fleet Admiral. Okay, so they're hanging out there just eating their lunch. Uh, Sengoku's goat, because he also has a goat, is just hanging out, chewing on a napkin. So that's really, uh, that, that's whatever. So they're talking about this latest event. They're talking about, oh, yes, um, you know, Vice Admiral T-Bone was killed. Uh, you know, and, and you know, what are we going to do about this? You know, we're supposed to be the Marines that are protecting the civilians, but now the civilians are turning on us. And they're saying, it's like, well, it's understandable because the particular region that T-Bone was in was stricken with poverty. So you can't really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like Suru's like, I'm not condoning the actions of the civilians, but I at least understand what led them to do this? What led them to killing a Marine officer to turn into pirates to then get money? And they mentioned that the family of the, we don't know exactly who did it, but that area, the family of the, of the uh, person that killed him is going to be receiving money. And that will help the family. So Osuru is not condoning anything, but she's like, I understand why they did it. And they also mentioned that like, if this continues, then the morale of the Marines is going to plummet. And nothing so crazy right now because T-Bone was like the first big name that was killed. But if this continues, if more and more high-ranking Marines, like Vice Admirals, Rear Admirals, they start dropping like flies, killed by the people they are supposed to protect, and then their bodies turned over to uh, to pirates to for money, um, you know, like blood money, like you can see how the morale of the Marines, like a lot of people would just, you know, retire right then and there. Just like, man, I, I I signed up to help the world. I didn't sign up to have a target on my back for every random bounty hunter and civilian in the world. You know what? I'm, I'm turning in my justice coat. I'm done. And you know, this could really be a problem. And they mentioned that they underestimated Buggy the Clown. I'm like, now you're finally realizing this. And I also want to appreciate, this is the former Fleet Admiral. This is Sengoku saying that they underestimated Buggy the Clown. 
Like, that is, that, there's some weight to that too, all right? Like, yeah. So they're mentioning, yeah, he wanted to cause chaos in the world. He wanted to bring about a state of being where the Marines have to look over their shoulders and, like, they're going to be demoralized and stuff, and that's working. It, at least the beginnings of that is working. So we overlooked this clown guy. We need to deal with this cross guild immediately. And you know what's funny? They don't even really bring up Mihawk or Crocodile all too much. They really just mention Buggy as the master mind of all of it, right? Yeah, Mihawk and Crocodile are there too, but just the act of, like, stamping a marine face on some wanted posters and scattering them to the world is enough to really cause havoc, okay? And to really upset the balance of everything, right? So, at this point, we have Hina, who uh, is a rear admiral at this point. Hina walks into the cafeteria, and Sengoku kind of waves over at her, and, she, and he's just like, Ah, Hina! Have you seen Garp? Uh, there's a new flavor of rice cracker I want him to try, you know? And this, is, this goes back to every time Sengoku and Garp are hanging out. Garp's usually munching on rice crackers in the corner or whatever. And uh, Hina mentions, like, Oh, yeah, Garp... Uh, he said something about going to save Kobe, and uh, he's probably with Sword. Uh, Kujaku's probably with him as well. So, uh, yeah, that's what's happening. And then you just have this reaction from Sengoku and Suru, like, what? You know, because Sengoku, obviously, former Fleet Admiral, best friend to Garp, and then Osuru is Kujaku's grandmother. So they did not hear about this. They didn't get a report that they were heading to Hachinosu. So Suru is finding out her granddaughter is at the Pirate Island, where one of the young Ko resides, and Sengoku is finding out that Garp is there as well. And they're like, oh, don't tell me they've gone to Hachinosu. And that's the end of the scene, but I I'm starting to question it. Does this mean Sengoku and Osuru are gonna, like, hop on a ship and go to Hachinosu? Please tell me that's the case. Oh my god, that would be great. That'd be insane, dude. They roll up to the island, and they're like reinforcements. Like, oh, you get to see Sengoku go all Buddha again. Suru using her wash wash fruit. Oh man, I would love to see those two in action. All right, let's get moving. Let's. And also, they were the three kind of like, you know, Sengoku, Osuru, and Garp joined the Marines together. So it'd be cool to see them all united again to get them back in the story. So yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Plus, what else do they have going on, really? Sengoku's job is primarily ceremonial. Uh, he's still a member of the Marines technically, but really he can kind of do whatever he wants. He's General Inspector Sengoku. And the reason he has that title is because the Gorosei cannot just let him go. They can't just let him retire to some far off island and, and just sever ties with the Marines. He knows too much for one thing. Also, he's really strong. So they're like, all right, all right, fine. You don't, you don't have to be Fleet Admiral anymore, but we can't just let you retire. So we'll give you just this ceremonial General Inspector title you can kind of do whatever you want, but you still have to be kind of hanging out at HQ. You know, you don't have to deal with the paperwork anymore. You can just lounge around all day, honestly, but uh, we still need you on the payroll, you know what I mean? So, the, he has nothing going on. Suru is one of the greatest and most distinguished vice admirals in the entire Marines. If she felt like just going to Hachinosu, getting a crew together, her crew would definitely abide by that. So, I think they could go. So anyway, we now cut over to Empty Bluffs Island, or Karibari Island, which is the home base a buggy D clown. You know what? I just realized I never did a geography is everything on uh, Kali Bali Island. I am slipping. I forgot. I thought I tackled all the major islands in One Piece. I need to do a geography is everything about that. All right. We got this video. We got T-Bone's remembrance video. And we got the geography is everything on Buggy's Island. And there's another video coming up that I'm actually, I was waiting on some artwork and I got it today. And oh my God, this is going to be a fun one. All right. So we have some stuff planned for the next week or so. Okay. So anyway, we cut over to Kaibari Island uh, where formerly Buggy was the warlord. This was the operation of Buggy's delivery service. Now it's the home base of Emperor. Emperor Buggy and the Cross Guild. So we have the man that was responsible for the death of T-Bone. And, you know, even though I just went on this long spiel about T-Bone, you really have to feel for this guy. This is not like your standard bounty hunter. This isn't like some buff dude covered in scars that's just like, ha, 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 I killed a vice admiral, yeah, give me money, you know, nothing like that. This is a frail old man, and this is where you definitely get the impression he... T-Bone was not somebody that fought back, okay? This frail old man is there. He looks to be about in his 50s or 60s. He's missing teeth. His, he's balding. He's wearing raggedy clothes and everything like that. He goes up. He's holding his, his little hat, and he's just like... Uh, 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 and he's like surrounded by pirates and shit. And the pirates are like, Yeah, you killed a Marine! And he's like, uh, I'm 
just, uh, I just did it so my family could get food. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Emperor Buggy. You, you provided money for my family. I, I heard from them that they got the money, so that's good, but I, I thank you. And so Buggy is just like really, you know, he's a, he presents. That's what he does. He's Buggy, right? He's got the silver tongue. So he's just like, ah, ha, ha, yes, of course. Do not be bashful. You slayed a Marine, and for that, we will pay you handsomely. We will make sure your family and village is taken care of, old man. Do not worry. However, if the Marines ever find out about you, oh, you are going to be killed. But do not worry. You will now be part of my pirate crew under the banner of Emperor Buggy the Clown Star. And so the old man is just like, I'm going to be a pirate? What? I was just a radish farmer. What is this? And then all the pirates, they come over and they're like, yeah, how you doing, old man? Yeah, we're, we're going to make you into a pirate. It's going to be a fun time. And he's like, I, I just, I need to lay down. <laughs> just like, so... You get the impression the place that this dude came from was just completely impoverished and really, really bad off. They did not want to kill anybody, let alone a Marine officer, somebody that was loved by the public. T-Bone was somebody that had not a bad bone in his entire body, okay? He was the dude that was literally ripping, you know, parts of his own Marine outfit off. He was tearing up parts of his own justice coat to um, bandage up Marines that had been injured during the battle on the sea train. He was so giving and selfless and so for altruism and generosity and charitability and these citizens literally were dropped so low, which honestly I say is a problem with the world government more rather than the cross guild or anything. And they just got to a point where this old man, he had a wife, he had kids, he had grandkids, he had friends and family that were dying, that were starving to death. And the only way he saw a way to get out of that in order to provide for his family is to take the life of this Marine. And he might have gotten some other people together, he might have been the mastermind behind it, or he might have just done it himself. And like I said, it probably went down something like, you know, T-Bone looking at him. T-Bone would have not have fought back, and he would have been like, Sir, I am a noble knight of justice. If you think slaying me will provide for your family, I will gladly lay down my life for you. And he's like, I'm so sorry! <laughs> You know, it was probably something like that. And this is like an old dude. He's like shaking and he's like in an emperor's like island. And he's like, I don't know. I don't want to be a pirate. I just wanted my family to eat and not die. You know what I mean? So you really feel bad for the situation. If nothing else, the situation in the One Piece world and the less fortunate islands that the world government and the Tenerobito just do not give a shit about. All right. That's the situation here. So, and also, hey, I mean, Buggy is a nice guy here. Buggy is a cool dude. He, first of all, he delivered on the promise. It's not like he's like, oh, yeah, you killed a Marine Admiral. Well, well, we can't pay you today, but next week. No, he provides the money to the family. The old man says, I heard from my family that you, you they received the money. It's like, oh, of course they did. I always go on my word. And, and you know, it's, 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 you can stay here. You'll be protected. You'll be one of us. You don't have to worry about being hunted down by the Marines and all that stuff. So, Buggy, if nothing else, is kind of a nice guy here. He's kind of helping out the impoverished people of the One Piece world, all right? Now, yeah, he's putting bounties on Marines and all that stuff, which isn't that great, but you know what I mean? Like, he's he, he's at least, you know, carrying out his word, right? Okay. So, um, let's see here. Uh, we have all the pirates huddling around the old man and everything, and then they start, uh, and then they start shouting Buggy's name and just like, all right, old man, you see that guy up there, that magnificent man up there, that's Buggy the Clown in the flesh. Buggy in the flesh! Buggy in the flesh! And then Buggy, you know, somebody comes in to say, like, uh, you know, I, I think they, they mix it up, so instead of saying Buggy in the flesh, this dude comes in and just says, Barley, you're fresh! <laughs> you know? So he's a like, Barley, fresh, and then Buggy makes a joke about, like, what does that make me, some kind of cereal? Buggy Circus Crunch, now on sale at your local grocery store. You get a free Captain John armband inside. Locate the treasure on your own. <laughs> So, yeah, there you go. Anyway, I think a buggy cereal would sell really well. I think it would, all right? Well, anyway, everybody's shouting. The person that came in to announce is uh, the shipwright, or one of the shipwrights that worked for the Cross Guild, and it's like, ha, ah, Emperor Buggy, it's finished. We worked around the clock, but we got the new Cross Guild flagship ready to go. And then Buggy's like, ah, thank you, man. So, um... We have a little flashback where Crocodile and Mihawk are there, and they're 
to, to talking about like, oh, we need a we need a ship. You know, if we're gonna be an emperor crew, if we're gonna do this cross guild style, we're gonna need a ship. And Buggy's like, oh, don't worry, guys, don't worry, fellas, <laughs> leave it to me. I, I got some of the best shipwrights in the whole world working for me. Don't worry, it'll be fine. And then they just kind of look at each other, Crocodile and Mihawk, like, all right. Okay, sure, we'll let you, okay, you know, and so now we see the the, the, the debut of the cross skilled ship. It doesn't have a name yet, but we see it in all of its splendor. It's this giant ship, it looks very impressive. It's got like a circus tent, just like Buggy's old ship, the big top had, and the figurehead is Buggy's head. And it has like the, the, the Buggy face, and then the hats, and then like swords underneath it for the cross guild. And then they're all happy and just be like, look at it, Emperor Buggy, isn't it magnificent? <laughs> you know, and you get to name it. And then this is the funniest thing where Buggy just, his, his, he just immediately starts breaking down crying, and he face faults, and He's like, I'm so dead. I am so dead. And he just kind of like looks behind him and Mihawk and Crocodile are there and they're just looking at the ship and they're like, all right, well, let's discuss this in the meeting room. And then Buggy, it's like being called into the principal's office. It's like, oh no. Oh no, I'm gonna die. And so we just cut to inside of the meeting room where Buggy, just his head, is swinging on a chain and it's beat to crap. So you know at this point, like, Buggy is immune from the cutting of, like, Mihawk and stuff, but I can imagine Mihawk took out Yoru and just like, all right, you're not gonna die from this, but... And then just cuts off his head and his head obviously is still... It, it, he's the Bara Bara Nomi, but he just uses that to decapitate Buggy and then hangs him up on a chain and then Crocodile and Mihawk just take turns beating the crap out of it like a speed bag just you know like something like that right and so buggy's there hanging on the chain and he's just like oh god please just uh, just finish it i don't even want to oh no <laughs> and it's like oh man oh this is brutal so crocodile's there right and he's reading the paper and he's like all right well that aside, um, public awareness of the cross guild, it's definitely getting up there. Navy starting to understand the threat that we uh, pose to the world. Um, pretty soon we're going to have all the things we need to create Utopia, the uh, military state. Now, Utopia was the name of the plan that Crocodile had stated. I don't know if you can see him on the camera. He's kind of off to the side here. But uh, that was the name of the plan during Alabaster, the Utopia plan or the, the Utopia project. Um, and here it's elaborated on a little bit on what that is. He mentions building a military state, but before that's established, uh, they need some overwhelming power and to really, to really like uh, strong arm their way in. And so, yeah, if you had this world destroying battleship, although we don't know what it is, but it, you know, the, the one that was created at Water 7 was a battleship. The real Pluton might be something different. But um, anyway, they mentioned, yeah, if you had that, if you had one of the ancient weapons in your at your disposal, then that would be more than enough overwhelming power to make any kind of military run state that you would want you know what I mean so they can't get their hands on Pluton but Crocodile still is going with this utopia project it's this it's just they need something else uh, they can't get their hands on the ancient weapon they need some other force of overwhelming power to really show the world they they don't mess around okay so that's what they need there um, and so uh, Buggy is kind of hanging on the chain there, and they're not really paying attention to him. It's more of a conversation between Crocodile and Mihawk. They're the ones discussing this. They're the brains of the operation. Buggy's just there in the background, just swaying on a chain. And then, though, he speaks up. And you know what? You can say whatever jokes you want about Buggy, and you can uh, exaggerate. Like, he's Buggy D Clown. He's the greatest pirate that ever lived. Whatever. Well, he is. But... This chapter, genuinely, without any sort of, like, hyperbole or exaggeration or comedic effect, genuinely made me feel, um, it, 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 it raised Buggy's stocks a bit as a person, all right? As not just a coward that ran away to the East Blue and, you know, didn't do anything else with his life, you know, whereas Shanks, who, they, they were both members of Roger's crew, Shanks goes out to become an, a Yonko and, like, apply himself, and Buggy is just, like, complacent, and he's, like, scared. Uh, he's a coward, really. This really made me think different of him in this chapter, where he's there, and he says, <clears throat> Listen, guys, I know I might be speaking out of turn here. I know I might be speaking out of turn, but can I at least say a few things here? It seems to me 
you two, Mihawk and Crocodile, you're doing this completely out of order. And Mihawk even kind of looks over at Buggy and he's just kind of like, oh, what is this? The cockroach is speaking to us. So it's like, oh man, they really think low of Buggy. So I want you to understand, Buggy just got the crap beat out of him. He just got decapitated, hung on a chain, and got the crap beat out of him like a damn speed bag. And... It's in his best interest to just shut the hell up and let Crocodile and Mihawk talk this out themselves. But no, Buggy is like, no, you know what, I'm still a damn pirate. I still got my honor and dignity, what little of it I have left. You guys are going about this all wrong. You're going about this backwards, okay? You know, he's like, you know, must have heard, right? Shanks, red-haired Shanks, he's on the move right now. And you know, me and Shanks, we were both on the same pirate crew. We were on the King of the Pirates ship. We both rode on the Oro Jackson, you know? You mean to tell me you have forgotten the reason you guys went out to sea? The reason for all of this? The reason all the pirates the last 24 years have went out to sea? We get a little bit of a flashback here, and this is an expansion on a flashback we had earlier. Remember when Shanks and Whitebeard met uh, aboard the Moby Dick? This was right after Enny's lobby, and Shanks spoke to him about, you know, you need to stop Ace, you need to stop him going after Blackbeard, it's dangerous. And Whitebeard was like, no, you know, kind of like that. Well, before that talk got to that point, um, they were kind of reminiscing a little bit, Shanks and Whitebeard. And Whitebeard kind of looked down at Shanks, and he's just like, hey, what happened to that clown-nosed kid that you always hung out with back on Roger's crew? <laughs> that guy was funny. And then Shanks is like, huh, buggy, eh? Well, we parted ways at Logtown after the captain was executed. I asked him to join my crew, but he declined. Not really sure what happened to him after that. Heard rumors he's still a pirate somewhere in the world, but eh, who knows. And so we get a little bit of a flashback in that episode where it's just Shanks asking Buggy, like, hey, Buggy, join my crew. And Buggy's like, screw you, I'm not helping you, and then they leave. Well, it's expanded upon a little bit here, and I really like this. First of all, Buggy freely admits to Crocodile and Mihawk that when I sailed with Shanks, he shone so brightly with potential, I could not measure up. So even though these two were at odds with one another, Buggy felt inferior to Shanks. You can kind of see where a lot of this hatred for Shanks really comes from. The whole thing with um, Shanks making him, you know, eat the Barra Barra no Mi and losing the treasure map, that was just a cover for his true feelings. This is how it really goes down. And Buggy is kind of being open to Crocodile and Mihawk here. He's kind of telling about, you know, his feelings and stuff to them. Uh, granted, Crocodile and Mihawk are not the best therapists in the world, but they try. They don't. Um, anyway, I would say Mihawk would be the better therapist than Crocodile would be. But anyway, he says, listen, we were both on the Pirate King's crew. We were, we were the same age. But I could tell I couldn't hold a candle to Shanks. Shanks was going to be the one. He was going to be the one that was going to succeed Roger. He was going to be the one that was going to carry that torch, and it wasn't going to be me. All right? And so Buggy had all these high expectations for Shanks. He didn't show it, but he did. And he felt that after Roger was executed, Shanks was going to immediately pick up that torch, and he was going to go find the One Piece. He was going to go become the next King of the Pirates, like immediately. Because remember, Buggy and Shanks could not go to Laugh Tale. And he even explains this. He, he relays that fact to Crocodile and Mihawk here. He's like, I, we could not go. But after the events, Shanks went up to Buggy and said, Hey, don't worry, Buggy. We'll go to Laugh Tale someday, you and me together. And so Buggy felt like, okay, the captain might be gone but Shanks is still here, and he's obviously, uh, he's obviously Roger's successor. I'll follow him. But Shanks, after Roger was executed, immediately went back on this. He, he backed up a bit, and he's like, I'm not going after the One Piece. And Buggy's like, what? What do you mean you're not going after the One Piece? You, you said you were! And Shanks is like, I know, I know, I know what I said, but I'm just... I gotta, listen, I'm still gonna be a pirate. I'm gonna get my, my crew together, but I can't just go after it right now. And is you can join me, Buggy. Come on, join my crew. And he's like, screw you, I'm not, no. And he just leaves, you know? And that's where he see storms off and says like, you, you, you made me lose that treasure map, you idiot. You know what I mean? And so, 
Buggy was crushed by that. He was crushed because he felt like, okay, the captain's gone, but at least we have Shanks. But then Shanks is walking back on his word, and he's like, I'm not going to be King of the Pirates right now. I'm not going to go to Laugh Tale right now. And Buggy was crushed by that, and he retreated back into the East, where he started his own crew on a much smaller scale. So uh, we get that flashback. Also, very, very important, a uh, little note, we see Shanks' face during this flashback when Roger was executed 24 years ago. He does not have the scar yet. We didn't know that. Um, because the only other time we saw this was when uh, in Strong World we saw the scene and uh, Shanks kind of had the hat kind of over his eye. So we don't really know when Shanks got that scar. Uh, I think most people could assume it didn't happen before Roger was executed, but it's confirmed here, okay? He got this scar at some point between... Uh, it would have been 24 years ago all the way up to 12 years ago when he met Luffy. But then Shanks was docked at Fuchsia Village for like a year before that when Luffy, I think, was around six. So maybe like somewhere between 24 and uh, 13 years ago, something like that, he got the scar. Okay, so that's important to mention there. So he's explaining this to Crocodile and Mihawk. He's telling them the whole story. And he's mentioning how, you know, I was pathetic and I retreated. But you know what? I still wanted to be the King of the Pirates. I want to be the King of the Pirates. And you know what? I don't know how the hell I ended up here. I have no idea how I, of all people, ended up next to Shanks as one of the emperors of the sea. But you know what? I'm not getting any younger. And if I'm an emperor, and if Shanks is an emperor, and I used to be a member of the captain's crew of Goldie Rogers' crew, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna be King of the Pirates. We're doing this. We can do it right here, right now. Let's go get the One Piece, and then we can do whatever we want. And keep in mind, once again, Buggy is saying this as he's swaying on a chain, completely helpless, after just being beat the crap out of by Crocodile and Mihawk, two of some of the strongest characters in the story. The balls Buggy would have to say that is this is dedication. This is who he really is. This is the man. These are the things that really drive him. All right. Now, wealth, power, why stop there when you can have it all? Let's go for it and claim the ultimate treasure. And that there's this big epic speech. And, and I imagine there's this like really triumphant, like when this scene's in the anime, really triumphant music's playing in the background, emotional music. And we have scenes with Crocodile and Mihawk there just just shocked at listening to the clown. And then Buggy is like ending his speech and he's just like, fame, wealth, power, let's go claim it all. Come on everybody, crocodile, Mihawk, come with me and we can become the king of the pirates. And then immediately Crocodile and Mihawk just boom, just punch him through a wall. <laughs> like, no, are you an idiot? My God, going off and on about King of the Pirates and One Pieces, you know, we, you don't even have a plan. We can't just go charge into Laugh Tail and get it, you stupid clown. So Crocodile, I think he just takes his hook and just BAM, smacks Buggy right off that hook, slams him into the ground. Um, Mihawk is like, you know, you expect us to just get up and deal with Blackbeard, Luffy, and Shanks. You're an idiot, you stupid clown. Don't open your mouth again, all right? And so you think he's like, he had this big epic speech and Buggy was gonna win over Crocodile and Mihawk, and no, it wasn't even close, but it's okay. Buggy doesn't need to win over Crocodile and Mihawk. So he gets knocked on the ground right next to a Den Den Mushy. And uh, he's there and he's just like, you know, that's what I mean though. You don't need to fight them. You don't need to defeat Shanks and, and Blackbeard and Luffy. All you need to do is beat them to the treasure. And I, I know we could do this. Ah, hold on. Hold on, this is the driving spark that inspires every pirate to go out to sea. Here, I'll show you. So he clicks on the Den Den Mushi, which is like a speaker system for the entire island. So every pirate on the island can hear Buggy speaking now. So he goes on and he's just like, listen up, men! And like Mihawk is like, like crushing his face and just like, hey, shut up, don't shut up, turn that off. And he's like, no, listen up, men! Do you remember the reason you went out to sea? The reason you all became pirates at the very beginning? It was to find the One Piece! Let's go and claim it! And then everybody on Kalibali Island is like, Yeah, Captain Bulgy! You know, and it's just like, all right. Now, here's the thing you gotta understand, all right? Buggy is lighting a fire 
under a lot of pirates asses that has not been stoked in a long time. How's that for a metaphor? So most pirates when they go out to sea is to find the One Piece because it's the most amazing thing ever. It's like something out of a fairy tale or something, right? It's this great golden treasure at the end of the Grand Line. Whoever gets it can control everything. The King of the Pirates, blah, blah, blah. I would imagine a lot of pirates though, after really noticing and realizing how tough the Grand Line is, how dangerous everything is, um, even if they choose to stay pirates, their goals shift. They're like, all right, well, I mean, we can't get the One Piece. That's impossible. That's way at the end of the New World. It's in Yonko territory. There's, we have to get the Pawnee. There's no way we could find that place. So a lot of pirates probably just settle. They settle for like, ah, we're just going to set up shop on this island, or uh, we're just going to deal with fighting other pirates, or we're going to deal with making our own island, or our own empire, or our own plan. And for one reason or another, they forget about the One Piece, and they move on. You know who is a perfect example of that? Crocodile. Yep. Crocodile was at the execution of Goldie Roger, just like Mihawk was, just like Buggy and Shanks were. He witnessed the, the Pirate King die, and Crocodile went out to sea, just like Moria did, and they went out to sea, and they went to become King of the Pirates. That was Crocodile's ultimate dream. We even saw that during Miss Golden Week's Meet Baroque cover series, when she used her rainbow colors, and that revealed the true dream of everybody that would see this rainbow. And Crocodile got, like, the Pirate King attire. He had, like, a Pirate King coat and, like, a hat, and uh, that's what he wanted more than anything. Still to this day. That's his one dream. After being defeated by Whitebeard and losing his hand, he decided, I can't do that anymore. I'm not going to try to become King of the Pirates. It's too high a pedestal to reach. I'm going to go over here to Alabasta and I'm going to do my own thing. And then he got defeated again. And so now he's trying this. So it's, it's, it's these dreams that people have more of like when they were in their youth and they were kind of just like childish, sort of like, I'm going to be king of the pirates. And then you realize how cruel the world is as you get older and older. And it's like, you can't be king of the pirates. It's impossible. There's a reason only one man was able to do it. And that was Roger. And he's not around anymore. So let's do our own thing. So for Buggy to come on this loudspeaker as an emperor of the sea and to announce to all of his uh, men that... Let's do it. Some of the pirates are like, oh, Captain Buggy's about to stoke the flame in my heart. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for this. Because this is something they'd all, they, they all feel ashamed of to, it, to an extent. That they gave up on their dreams. If you ever had a dream in your life that you had to give up on for whatever reason, there's a little bit of remorse. There's a little bit of regret there. And most pirates feel that. They just never think about it. But Buggy's making them think about it. He's making them remember the reason they went to sea. And so they decide, you know what? Can we actually do this? Can we actually do it? I thought it was impossible to find the One Piece. But... Here we are on an Emperor's crew with the Captain, with Buggy, and Mihawk, the greatest swordsman in the world, and Crocodile, who's made of sand. We can totally get the One Piece. We can do this. And they are just, just completely just it just a wash in emotion. All the pirates on the island are weeping and crying and like, Buggy, you're our savior, you know? Literally looking at Buggy as like a, a messiah figure right now. Crocodile and Mihawk aren't so charmed. They aren't so happy about this situation. And you know what's fascinating to me? If you look at this scene with Mihawk and Crocodile as they're responding to this, how every, by the way, everybody's riled up now. So you gotta do it. You gotta go forward with it. Everybody's excited. And they did not want Buggy to do this. Mihawk looks a little perturbed. Mihawk looks a little pissed off. And there's a reason for that. Mihawk never wanted the One Piece. Mihawk was never really a pirate. He was more of a serial killer, if we're being honest. He would just go out and murder marines. So, and then he became a warlord, and he's like, all right, I'm just going to hang out. But he never had a pirate crew. He was never interested in the One Piece. He's just interested in being the strongest swordsman in the world and fighting other challengers. That's all he's interested in, okay? So he's, like, upset by this, but his, his motivations are different from everybody else. Crocodile, though, looks absolutely livid. He gets the brain vein popping. He bites through his his cigar. He always has that big fat cigar in his mouth. When Buggy pulls this stunt, he does, he chomps right through that cigar. And he's like, you, you know, because this hurts, this hurts. He's telling the truth. He's touching a nerve that Crocodile hasn't thought about in decades. Crocodile's in his mid forties. He was in his mid twenties when he went to sea to become King of the Pirates and he was defeated by Whitebeard. 
This is a wound he has not probably thought about. He tried to push that down in his subconscious for 20-something years. And Buggy just brought it right up to the surface. So he, now the way Crocodile responds to this is rage. He's like, how dare you? You know what I mean? But it's truth. It hurts. And I think Crocodile, after he simmers down a little bit, he might start getting motivated again. He might be pissed for a while, beat the crap out of Buggy, certainly. Buggy is going to be on death's door after this is over. But after it's over and after Crocodile calms down a bit, later that night, maybe he goes into his room, takes a shower, relaxes, smokes it like three cigars at once, just... <sighs> maybe I can do it this time. Maybe we can get the One Piece, you know? And he's like, don't, don't, don't give me hope. <laughs> don't give me hope only to dash it into smoldering cinders again. You know what I mean? So this might be Crocodile, but Buggy Man, he's the MVP. So now, we cut to the end of the chapter, last scene of the chapter, Kamabaka Queendom on the Grand Line, where we're introduced to four semi-new characters. We get introduced to the four vice commanders of the Revolutionary Army, and I was waiting for this. I was wondering if Oda was actually going to go out of his way to introduce them individually, or just have a group shot. Group shot works. Uh, we've seen some of them before. We've actually seen three of them before. So, um, if you look at this scene right here, uh, you can see some people sitting at the table that have not been named yet. We see somebody who looks to be like a cow mink. Uh, we see someone who looks like Humpty Dumpty, like an egg-shaped body, and we see a woman with a cyborg arm. The only one out of these three that were ever actually named was uh, Ahiru, who is the woman with the cybernetic um, left arm, I believe. Yes, it's her left arm. And uh, Ahiru just means duck, or the domestic duck in Japanese. So, you know, the whole thing with Oda naming women after birds. There we go. So she's a duck. She could have taken down Kaido easily. So she was named, uh, but the other two Two, Humpty Dumpty and the Cow Mink were never named, and the fourth member we have actually not seen yet until this chapter. At least I believe we have not seen him until this chapter. So these four vice commanders are on the shore of the Kamabaka Queendom looking out to sea, and a ship is beginning to arrive there, and so they're taking bets on who could it be. It's just like, oh, I bet you a million berries it's Sabo. And they're like, nah, it's not Sabo. There's no way. It's probably an enemy attack. I don't know. And Ahiru even takes out her cybernetic arm, and she's like charging it up like a pacifista laser cannon like there's a bullet hole or like a laser uh, barrel right there and she's like about to open up a fire on the ship, right? So we get the names of these four individuals here. Uh, I'm just gonna, you know what, I'm just gonna pick up my laptop here and just read them here. All right, so... <clears throat> Uh, first guy, we have the cow mink. Uh, I believe he's a cow mink. It hasn't actually been stated, but he looks like a cow, so I'm going to go with cow mink. Um, he is the vice captain of the Western Army under Morley, and he, his name is Ushiano. Ushi just meaning cow or ox in Japanese, so that continues the theme here. I'm thinking they might all be named after animals, but I'm actually not sure about the other two. Ahiru is named after a duck. Ushiano is obviously named after a cow, and he looks like a cow. He's a mink, probably. But the other two, I'm not really sure. So let me know about the names. I was trying to look it up online, but I don't know what like original kanji and stuff that are used. So let me know. Uh, the Humpty Dumpty dude is named uh, Giambol. And his name might just be a reference for Gamble, but I'm thinking maybe like two animals and like maybe there might be other animals that might be a reference to. Uh, I don't know the kanji. Giambole is Lindbergh's subordinate, so he is the vice commander of the Southern Army. Uh, then we have Ahiru, who is the vice captain under Bello Betty of the Eastern Army. And finally, we have the new guy, we have Giron. Jiron is Karasu's subordinate from the North Blue. He's the vice, uh, vice commander under Karasu, okay? And so... They're all uh, watching out to sea to see whose uh, ship is arriving, and it turns out, lo and behold, Sabo is on this ship. So we see the last scene of the chapter. We see Sabo arriving at the island. Uh, he comes out. He's fine. He's a little bandaged up like, like we saw him last time, but he was not nuked from the sky. We find out that he was actually not on the island. Called it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and oh, by the way, if you're wondering which video I called it in, it never happened. It never happened at around the 14 minute mark. Never happened. All right. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That was okay. So he was actually on a ship that was outside of Lelusia that was leaving the island. He got a bunch of the citizens of Lelusia together to join the revolutionary army. He got them on a ship and he was sailing away from Lelusia 
when the sky weapon attacks. So the island is still gone. The island is nuked. A lot of people died, but not everybody did. Sabo's still alive, and so is Moda. The lady that uh, Ace helped in his cover story when he was looking for Blackbeard, and she also fought back against Peachbeard when Bello Betty was there and everybody, the, the, uh, just the farmer girl, you know, she shows up. She's perfectly fine in the background, and she's actually a new member of the Revolutionary Army. Oda, I love when you do this kind of stuff. You take a character that was introduced in the side, it's just like not a big deal. Like, no, this is Moda's story. She has a little story arc going in the background. I love that kind of shit, right? So he says, yeah, I was on a, I was on a ship. I was leaving the island when it attacked. And if you go back and actually look at the chapter when the light comes down, Sabo, the way the shadow is hitting him, he's actually looking off to the side. It's not like he's looking directly above, like the light's coming straight down, like, oh no, we're all gonna die. No, it's like, Huh? And the shadow's coming from another direction. So there were hints and foreshadowing that Sabo, in fact, was not on the island when it hit, okay? Well, anyway, we have the vice commanders there, and they're like, See, I told you it was Sabo. Give me a million. I'm not paying you. How did you even know he was there, anyway? Oh, I looked at him from the binoculars. What binoculars? Oh, you ate them. That's a little bit of a note there. Uh, so, Jiron, who is the vice commander under Karasu of the North Army, we see him looking through a pair of binoculars out at sea, but then afterwards, he takes the binoculars and just... and just eats them. Just... Yep, what binoculars? Nope, nope, I, I think it's Sabo. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't see him. I don't have binoculars. So, devil fruit ability, I guess? Uh, he's able to eat binoculars. Uh, okay, so immediately I thought of the munch munch fruit, but that's Wapple's fruit, and Wapple is already confirmed to still be alive. He's with the uh, World Economic Journal and Vivi and everybody, so he still has his fruit. I mean, honestly, I mean, if you want to go crazy with it, you could just say, well, you know, Dragon knows Vegapunk, and Vegapunk knows how to create artificial devil fruits and copy them. Uh, but I don't think it's the Munch Munch fruit. I, I don't think. Or a copy of the Munch Munch fruit. I think it's another fruit that allows him to eat something. Um, so similar, because there's a lot of fruits that are similar in abilities, but different enough. It might be some kind of ability to, I don't know... Maybe he can assimilate any matter into him, so it's similar to the Munch Munch fruit, but instead of having to, maybe he doesn't need to physically eat anything. Like, it'd be cool if uh, maybe he had a devil fruit where he could take the binoculars and just like, you know, just like push them into his body, and then his eyes become binoculars. Or he takes a sword and stabs it into his arm, and then his arm becomes a sword. So, you know, Wapple can do that too, but it would just be a different mechanism of how it works, like an assimilation assimilation fruit. And he's just choosing to like eat it because it's just his quirk or something. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. I don't know. Anyway, I just want to bring that up. Uh, Ahiru also mentions, I almost fired a shot at your ship, and Sabo's like, oh, I'm hoping I'm glad you didn't. So that might be Passy Feast tech that she's rocking right there. A hero might have a Passy Feast to Cyborg arm right now. Also, fun fact, only Cyborg female in the entire story. So Frankie, you know, <laughs> there you are. Anyway, no, Frankie is with Robin, obviously. Yes. So um, Sabo is there. Everybody's happy, of course. Koala comes in, and it's such an adorable scene where she drop kicks Sabo in the chin, but then she like goes up and hugs him. Like, I missed you. Why didn't you tell us that you were okay? And Sabo's like, I couldn't contact contact you without being, I didn't have an encryption transponder snail, I didn't have a way to contact you. I sent the signal, I sent the three dashes that should have let you know I was okay, and then Koala's like, ah, oh, you idiot, and it's like, oh, those two are a perfect couple. <laughs> okay, man, a lot of shipping in these last few pages, okay. Uh, Morley's happy, she's crying, you know, Bello Betty's there. Bello Betty walks up to the um, members of Lelucia, and she's like, oh, hey, you guys have come a long way since the last time I saw you. Remember the revolutionaries were the one that saved them from Peach beard. And so you guys seem to be toughened up a little bit. All right. Tell you what, you go rest, you eat, you take showers, hang out for a while, and then we'll start putting you in line. We'll start training you for the revolution. How about that? So Bella Betty's there kind of welcoming all the newcomers and they're like, yes, ma'am. And it's like, okay, we're gonna, this is going to be fun. Last scene, we have Dragon, Ivankov, and Sabo in a private room. In the, in the castle of Kamabaka, sitting around a table with a revolutionary army um, flag on it. Uh, now remember, Ivankov, Dragon, and Kuma were the three members that founded the army. Kuma's not there anymore. They mentioned this to Sabo. They said he might have some programming to allow him to return to Marie Joie in case of a contingency or something like that. But we don't really know what happened with him. So Sabo's kind of there in Kuma's place right now. Kuma, maybe, maybe Kuma used to be the chief of staff of the revolution before... Um, 
uh, before Sabo. It was Dragon as the commander, Ivankov as the Grand Line commander, which is their most important branch, and then Kuma as the chief of staff, the second in command. Kuma left to be a warlord, and so Sabo, when he grew up, he became the chief of staff. So these are the three. Commander of the Revolution Dragon, Grand Line Commander of the Revolution Ivankov, and the Chief of Staff of the Revolution Sabo. There we go. Sabo sits down and he's like, alright guys, I couldn't tell you this before, but I'm going to tell you now. I will tell you about what really happened at the Holy Land of Marijois during the Reverie. Boom. End of chapter. Doesn't say a break, but like I said, it's Golden Week next time in Japan, next week in Japan, so it might be like two weeks or so until the next chapter. So this is it. I mean, banger chapter after banger chapter. It keeps on rolling, ladies and gentlemen. Oda keeps bringing the fire. Um, we might find out about Eam next chapter, guys. Or we might find out at least what he looks like or how so what Sabo saw. And the fact that Dragon is getting this information is the worst case scenario for the government. The government doesn't want this information getting out. This information made it all the way from Marijua to the commander of the revolution, the most dangerous man in the entire world, Monkey D. Dragon. Okay, the Gorosei, if they knew this meeting was happening, would be shitting their pants right now. Okay, this is a big, big, big deal. Okay, huge, huge deal. So, um, yeah, a uh, lot to unpack with this one. Huge amounts to unpack. There's a lot in this chapter. Stuff with Buggy, stuff with Mihawk and Crocodile, stuff with T-Bone, stuff with Sabo, right? Um, but yeah, I, 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 I hope more than anything, especially with this being the Golden Week break, I hope more than anything, I love the Straw Hats, I really do. Do not go back to the Straw Hats in the next chapter, Oda. Please, please, please. At least, if you're going to cut back to the Straw Hats next chapter, give us a little bit of, of Sabo first. Give us a little bit of explanation. You could have him talking about what happened and then like, oh, Dragon, that's not all that happened. Also, dot, 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 and then it cuts over to Egghead. Fine, if you want to do that, fine. But give us something with Sabo next chapter. Please. Anyway... Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, like I said, kind of an unplanned video today. Uh, it was delayed a little bit because I had to plan the eulogy for T-Bone. Also, I forgot to charge my camera last night, so I had to wait for that to charge. In which case, I think it might actually be getting close to dying here. So I'm going to get going. Uh, let me know how you felt about T-Bone's death, the new commanders of the revolution, or the new vice commanders that we just got introduced to, Sabo returning, and uh, what's up with Buggy and his motivation and the cross guild and what they're doing next. A lot of videos coming up, and I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy. Thanks for watching, everybody. This will be teching signing out remembering travis d boner